Gavin Campbell, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you, Julie. Thank you for having me. Hey, it's my pleasure. So first, I want to tell people you're actually uh, joining me from uh, Jamaica. That's correct. Sunny, sunny, That's... and bright Jamaica. I am so jealous. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> I have seen the snowstorms, and they do not look pleasant. Yeah. So what's the temperature like right there, right now? Uh, right now, it's about 26 degrees, and the maximum it would go up to is around 33 for this time of year, and minimum is 23. Okay, and it's is it always warm? I've, I've never been to Jamaica, so I'm going to ask the stupid questions, but is it yeah. usually around that range? Yeah, it's usually around that range. No, it's actually the cooler time of the year, and it does go a bit hotter during the summer months, but it's pretty warm throughout the year, and the coldest it would get is around 18 degrees, and that's in the higher altitudes and during the less sunny periods of the year. Oh, wow, so you're living a pretty good life then. Yep, it's pretty good. Like We even complain when it reaches 23, 25, because to us, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. It's always like that. We always mm -hmm. want what, uh, what other people don't have. Um, and you are studying, you're doing, uh, you're finishing up your PhD at the University of the West Indies um, in Jamaica. Would you mm -hmm. call yourself more of an ecologist or an entomologist? So I'd call myself more of an ecologist because I do like all the different aspects of the environment. And I do focus a lot on the, the physical and environmental factors that influence the, the insects. Um, but both would be correct either way. Okay. Um, before we get started about all that cool stuff that you're researching, uh, today is actually quite a of, of a pinnacle day in space yes. exploration. We were just talking about this before the podcast started, uh, mm -hmm. because and 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 just to make a point here that this episode will air several weeks after we've we've spoken, but um, we've just put a new robot on Mars today. Yes, Perseverance has landed and landed safely, so we're super excited to see what's going to be happening at the Jazeera Crater. Is it um is it making you want to just quit ecology and go into astronomy or <laughs> become you know an astrophysicist or something? I feel when it comes to research and science, all individuals start off with those extremes. Like they want they see so much space exploration going on growing up, and they want to go become an astronaut, go on on Mars. But as we grow up, we realize that those necessarily aren't the things that we want. But I would always drop everything for an opportunity to go to Mars. Not to stay permanently, but to get another worldly experience. That might not and be available also, for the next few years, but something that I'd be interested in. For sure. But I mean, also what's interesting about this mission is that this is potentially the first time that we're going to get soil samples from Mars, right? Yes. So I saw that while well, I was watching a video yesterday, and there are going to be some drills that are going to take soil samples. And they're going to be left on the surface for another um, machine to pick up later on, or person, possibly. Right, that's true. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that that must have you pretty excited then. Yeah, because I do do work on, on soil myself, so I know how dynamic they can be. So it'd be so interesting to actually have the samples here. And with um, the resources in on Earth, we'd be able to do so many more analyses and get a more of a a hard feel for what it's like to be on other planets. How similar is Martian soil to our soil? And this kind of makes you, makes you realize that you're part of a whole big universe. Yeah, I was interviewing uh, Ben Pierce, who's an astrobiologist. He's coming back on the show soon. And uh, mm -hmm. we were talking about, you know, um, soil samples mm -hmm. on other planets oh. and how cool it would be to discover like a space tardigrade. <laughs> that would be epic. That, seeing that they can survive for so long, it might be a possibility. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, and then also we're, we're, we're launching a, a helicopter on Mars for the first time. So there's a lot of new yes. stuff going on. That is, it is, is insane how detailed everything is to even be able to land everything safely on the planet and then to have everything deployed afterwards. It's, it's so ingenious to me. Like I find that so awesome. And the, the amount of human talent and skill mm -hmm. and collaboration, is that something that you as a scientist, are you someone who prefers to work on your own or do you dream of being on a big team like the one at NASA? I do dream of being on a big team. So I do love working on my own when I have to, but I do really love being a part of a big team because 
at that point to realize that everyone is important for every aspect of whatever they're doing. So whereas I myself am focusing on insects for my research, someone else might be focused on um, the law to protect the insects in my uh, in my pond. Someone else could be focused on the geology and geography. So whereas those things may not particularly interest me, I can see where they specifically add quality to my work and how we're all one big part of a team. And it gives me a better appreciation for everything that everybody does and how humans themselves can make awesome things by working together. So like right now, uh, you're doing your PhD. So do you have other colleagues that are chiming in on your work? Yes, I do. We all do. So during some sampling trips, everyone does help out. If someone needs to go somewhere and they need help to collect their samples while they're, we are here, we are available. We like to schedule a day to go for that sampling. And for me particularly, I help out with those trips, actually field sampling and helping people with their data because some, that's something I really enjoy, like working with data. So being able to help my friends with that is awesome. That's really cool. And it's even interesting is um, the differences between universities in Jamaica and universities in North America. I was speaking with a student who um, did some time in Germany where she studied in university in Germany. She's Canadian. And she was Mm -hmm. telling me how the academic experience was so vastly different. For example, the university that uh, the one she was at didn't have sports teams. So I don't know if you've ever been to a university in North America, but can you think of some differences that would be maybe culturally different from universities in North America? So I haven't necessarily been to any universities in the um, on the North American continent, but I have seen some differences on Twitter, particularly when it comes to stress. I have seen so many researchers talk about how stressful everything is, how they feel pressured to do this and that. But when it comes to here, I guess it's maybe island life. We don't stress so much because we understand that as important this work is, we also deserve to enjoy life and to not be stressed out and not be in mental decline because of the work. So no matter what, like if we ever have any issues with um, with work, we're, we're bombarded or whatever, our students will come together and just like hang out and our supervisors will like advocate for us to take a day off just to break some time because they realize that the most important thing isn't the work itself, but the person doing the work. And if we burn out at this point, then we won't be able to do the work later. So it's more of a, it's more closely interconnected. People are more friendly. People are more open with their, um, with their feelings. So that's the, the main difference I've seen so far. There are other that's a aspects. Huge as well difference. Too. That's a yeah. huge difference too. Mm-hmm. It's something that I've, I've when it, when everyone is talking about um, how they're stressed on Twitter. I'm like, so stop stressing. (laughs) I know it's definitely more complicated than that, but it's so strange to see how everything is so focused on getting the work done and not on the person itself. So it's a bit strange when I see it. So I understand when people need to talk and they need to, to vent because of all the frustrations. And even doing the work itself can be all consuming and frustrating, but it's important to remember that you have a life separate from all the work. Yeah, that's so that's so true. And I'm even um, very impressed by the fact that you said that your professors even encourage that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, even my supervisor retired last year and he calls to check up on us. And after we talk about the work stuff, we talk about what's going on. I even told him like the other day that after I'm finished, I wanted to do um, to pursue voice acting and he was on board. He was like, I, I don't know where you could check out, but go for it, you know? Huh. That's really cool. You um, <laughs> yeah. I, I cut you off earlier. You were going to, you were just about to tell me a second difference that you were going to uh, to mention. I believe I have forgotten. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, no problem. No, but it is it is a, a really really big one, and it's an important one that that I think that we need to look at different mm-hmm. academic systems and how they do things. And I think you're right. I think there is um. Uh, maybe not so much in Canada. I think it maybe it's more in the United States, but there is absolutely mm-hmm. this huge pressure, especially at the graduate level. True. That's very true. And I've also spent some time in, in Europe, in France specifically, and I saw how chill things are, even more chill than island life here. So I was working as an intern, and I saw that they had dedicated time in the morning and the afternoons, an hour each, 
overall two hours per day, that those two hours are dedicated to actual camaraderie. So in the first few hours or the first hour in the morning, people would be focused on talking about what their day was like the day before or their weekend was like, what's going on in their work, and just generally chat, share food, play games. And then in the second one, it would be focused on playing puzzles most of the time. But because I, at the time, was not very fluent in French, I could not play. So I just kind of went into my office while some experiments were running and was there watching cartoons while that went on. And it was it was really eye-opening because here, the work environment is very strict. You have to be in an office for this particular amount of um, hours every day. But seeing that there is such an open environment there, the work they're doing is amazing, but they're also taking time to focus on the humans themselves that I really appreciate about the experience. Oh, that's really interesting, too. I didn't know that about France. I knew that, I mean, uh, I'm French-Canadian, so I, I, I know a lot about French culture. Um, mm. I know that on French film sets, for example, for uh, unionized film sets when you were shooting a movie, um, at least back back when I looked it up, you had to supply the actors with wine. It was just something <laughs> that you do in mm. France, you know? Yeah. So mm. it doesn't surprise me to learn that they're very kind of laissez-faire, as we would say in French. <laughs> mm, that's awesome. I do not want to <laughs> want the chance practicing my French and then it not be as well as I think. <laughs> But I'll I'll jump in with a few words here and there. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, Gavin. So you study well. Right now, I think your research is mostly on temporary ponds, right? That's correct. So I study the aquatic organisms as well as the terrestrial organisms in temporary ponds. A lot of the research has been focused on just the organisms that are aquatic. But after the pond dries out, I want to look at what happens to the terrestrial ecosystem before and after so does there mm. sorry I'm, I'm gonna cut you off right here just to tell you mm. that one of the coolest things ever when it was when i saw that 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 that's what you were researching because i have noticed a lot of ponds well not a lot okay a handful of mm. ponds in my neighborhood mm. that tend to be full during the summer and then they just dry up is that mm. what you mean when you say a temporary pond yeah, so a temporary pond is exactly like that. They're inundated at some point, they have water at some point, and then they have no water at some point. So they go between terrestrial and aquatic environments. And when it comes to temporary ponds, a lot of people have focused on the aquatic, but not so much the terrestrial. And what I'm focusing on is seeing if the terrestrial and aquatic um, influence each other. Do they make each other stronger or exactly what's going on? That is so cool. I'm just going to say it like that. I'm, I'm like, so, I'm, I'm totally nerding out right now and it's making me so happy <laughs> because, because I don't even know where to start with the questions. I want to know, like, it's okay. So first of all, have you found a link yet between the two? So I have found a link, but I'm working on another data set to see if that link is exactly because of the pond or it's because of the area. But so far, I've found that there are over 125 species within just a little 0.6 of an acre plot. So it's in, incredibly insane how great the diversity is and how little work is done on them. Because you wouldn't, when you look at it, you wouldn't think, oh, this is incredibly full of species. It's just a little plot, just grass. But when you look at it at all the levels, both aquatic and terrestrial, and also microbial, there are so many different species there. And I even found a shrimp that hasn't been recorded in Jamaica for the past 88 years what? and that has never been recorded in the south of the island. So I am so excited because there's so much to come from such a tiny space. You're like a groundbreaker, no pun intended. <laughs> I do have those groundbreaking moments. <laughs> That's really cool. You found a shrimp. Is it um freshwater, I guess? Yeah, it is freshwater. And it's not necessarily the typical shrimp. It's a clam shrimp. What's a clam shrimp? So a clam shrimp is, is a shrimp that has a little bivalve. So it kind of is enclosed within two shells. Oh, do you it mean looks... like a like a seed shrimp? Yeah, a seed shrimp. Like an ostracod? Yes. Well, ostracod uh... is a little bit different. So they do okay, have the shells. Okay, hold on. Tell me the difference. <laughs> like when I, I only found out the difference a few months ago because the first time I saw it, I thought it was an ostracod because of the bivalve shell. But after having asked some other experts in the field, they told me it's a different kind of shrimp. So the ostracods are the seed shrimps, and the 
um, the clam shrimps are another group. They're a group of branchiopods themselves, Ever which is a whole cool. different order. Yeah, just for people who are listening who are totally not scientists, but who are interested in science, a seed shrimp is it's kind of like a it's like a shrimp that lives inside a clam. Would that be mm. the best way to say it in English? Like in plain English? It does look like a clam, yeah. Like both of them look like clams because they're small and they have little bilateral shells. But officially the clam shrimps are the brachiopods or a group in the brachiopods, and the seed shrimps are ostracods specifically. But they both do look so similar. I had to spend some time looking through different pictures of them to see what the differences were. And even now, it's a little bit vague, but I can tell more accurately the differences. That's really neat. And so you found this shrimp in the water or when it was drying up? It was in the water. So I started studying the pond in November of 2017. And for the first two months, it wasn't there. But in January of 2021, of 2018, there was a massive explosion of them. There were thousands of them in the water. And I was like, what is this? I've never seen this before. What's going on? And it was just so interesting because there were thousands of them and they keep coming back. And they have eggs that can survive several months in dry conditions. And then when it rains to fill the pond back up, they come back to life. So it's it's so cool to see their adaptations to these different challenges and one of the big impacts about or of my research is looking at what different organisms do to survive these dry, dry, very hot conditions and how we can use those adaptations to predict how the communities will change over time and what the benefits because some services they provide in the present and in the future will be. That's really fascinating. I'm I'm interested in what you just said here. So you start you started observing the pond in 2017. In 2018, they presented? Yeah, so two months after I started, they presented. How, okay, so this is one thing I don't understand about how the world works. When you have a, <laughs> um, when you have a pond, and then all of a sudden you start to see new creatures in them, where the heck do they come from? <laughs> that was a question I had at the time, and I still do have for that particular species, but I'm, I still haven't been able to answer it. So one of the things is transportation. So our, some organisms are able to fly in and inhabit the pond. Some also hitchhike based on their associations with birds and other organisms. So ostracods, for example, they are actually able to survive being passed through the, dig the digestive system of birds. So if they're eaten and the bird flies somewhere else and they get pooped out into another pond, they could start up their population in that pond. And there are certain human activities that also facilitate their transportation. So when it comes to my pond, what I think happened with my shrimps was that in the construction of the pond, the soil was taken from somewhere else. And in that soil, most likely were eggs of that species. And from that, when inundated, they were able to hatch out and start their own little population there. Okay, so this is a pond that you actually built. It was built by the university to help to protect um, uh, another building because of um, flood activity or stormwater activity during heavy rains. But one day I saw, I was just walking by on the campus and I saw that there was a bird in there. I was like, why is a bird in this random puddle of water? So after a few research articles, I went in and I saw what they were. And the, the, the very next day, I was out there in the pond collecting data. I was working on cave um, species before, and that one had some challenges. But as soon as I got into this, there was no hesitation. I ran straight in. I was going to do a little side project on this pond, but it ended up being my main project. So I am super happy to have seen that bird in that pond at that time. Isn't that amazing? I mean, this is, again, this is why I interview artists and scientists, because you just saw a bird in a pond, and it changed the entire direction of your research. Yep. <laughs> It's incredible. It's been, it really is. It has been so incredibly interesting because with every experience, there are so many more things to learn about it and so many things that affect it overall. So there's the intensity of rain, how much, um, what the temperature is, how much vegetation is around it, what aquatic insects are there, what birds are there, um, and even the amount of interaction with humans that it has to. So there's so many, there's so many different facets to understanding what is going on in this small puddle. 
Yeah, it's it's really fascinating because here in Ottawa, uh, Ontario, Canada, we have a a canal. So it's called the Rideau Canal, and it's a canal that they drain uh, in the winter or really in the early fall. So it's kind of empty. It's kind of dry in certain parts for, I would say, maybe two months, and then it starts to snow, and then they, it ices up, right? Mm-hmm. But then again, in the spring, it starts to get muddy and dry, and then they open the canal gate, gates, and it just fills up with water. And so I've been doing kind of similar work to what you've been doing, just mm-hmm. not really knowing what I was looking at. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but this is really providing me with quite the education. So what... Okay, so tell me a little bit about what you find in there when there's water. So normally when there's water in the pond, I would collect the, uh, the insects that are drawn from that tertial environment. And there's quite a few of them that are there. I even found an endemic snake in the pond one time from the drawn water. And after that initial event, you have different gr- different groups of organisms that fly in. And you have dragonflies, very obvious. They're the ones that are flying around most often more often but they don't necessarily have their aquatic stage immediately they do in the, in the later parts of it but the main things that are there immediately are the clam shrimps that i had mentioned and then some aquatic insects called um, hemipterans but more specifically nosonectids and mesovelids as well as a whole bunch of different dietes which are beetles what about microscopic life so that one I actually started working on in the past year. So I have found a lot of the densities of the microscopic live um, organisms are not that high. So I found a lot of cyanobacteria, a lot of algae, and mostly a lot of prot- protists. I've only ever found one tardigrade, though, unfortunately. <laughs> that was my next question, actually. <laughs> I remember, I remember having seen one of your posts, and you said that there were tardigrades just on your balcony. And when I, I've looked at some other samples as well, too, and I've only ever found one tardigrade anywhere. So I'm wondering if there might be like a, a zonation when it comes to different groups. So the animal that's most represented for us would be rotifers, and for you would be tardigrades. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I guess it might depend on environment and, um, you know, species types and all that stuff, right? Yeah. So interesting to see like different questions pop up just from random points. Do you have a lot of worms? Worms? We I actually recently found a flatworm in the sample as well, too. But there are some regular earthworms that do get inundated and sadly drown after being inundated, after the pond is inundated. But they attract the birds as well, too, like the dead worms being easy prey. They attract the birds, so can't really complain too much about all of that. Okay, so now let's say the pond uh, starts to drain, or I don't know what happens in yours. Uh, maybe it just evaporates. Um, so now it's, let's say we're in the middle stage between being kind of with water and completely dry. So let's say it's kind of mucky right now. So what do you find mm-hmm. there? So when it's drying out, so in the beginning stages, everything's filled up. But the, the main way that the pond loses water is actually through infiltration. The evaporation rate is quite low compared to infiltration rate. So they lose water not necessarily by evaporation itself. And what I find, so most of the organisms themselves, they don't actually leave because a lot of them are restricted to the aquatic environment. They can't necessarily crawl away or fly away. The adults can, but I rarely see them actually do that. They'd stay in the environment. But the ones that are left behind are going to be the nymphs of the dragonflies, the larvae of the beetles, the larvae of the flies and everything. And those ones they start to do strange things. So one thing that I found is the beetles specifically, they start to cannibalize each other. And one of the things that happens in temporary waters is cannibalism, because in eating faster, you can get more resources and grow faster. So you can reach your adult stage and fly away and not be dependent on the aquatic stage. So that actually there's even been a frog that does that. When they realize that the pond is drying out, they will eat each other in or they'll change morphs and become more predatory to eat each other to make sure that they can become adult frogs that don't rely on the aquatic environment and then keep going around. Oh my god. I know, <laughs> I mean, right? I'm I whoa, really? Yep. Really? So oh man, so you've actually so you've been able to actually 
observe that that's what happens. So let's start with beetles because my mind is just blown right now. Um, so the beetles will actually detect that the the levels are, let's say, becoming lower. And so they can actually um, precipitate the speed of their growth. Yeah, they can. So I haven't seen directly any footage, any information on that happening because they take several weeks to grow. But when the fun starts drying out, it happens relatively quickly. But I have seen individual beetles eating each other. So if it were that um, in the rainy season, if it were like uh, drying out and they were able to eat each other, they'd be able to grow more quickly, but they'd still need more time. So in the rainy season would be when it'd be best for them to do that. And how fascinating is it that it's not just the beetles? Like you said, it's the it's the frogs too. Yeah, so I've the frogs were in, I think Arizona. I'm not 100 percent sure, but it's an area that dries pretty quickly and pretty rapidly. So they they literally change their physical features in order to predate other organ, other individuals of the same species, so that they can grow faster and survive the drying out period as adults. That is quite the adaptation. Yeah, that's that is it's also been recorded in I think flies. I'm not sure which ones, but I think there was a, a paper talking about flies doing the same thing. Wow. Mm. Okay, so well cool. that's yeah, I'm gonna have to do some some Googling after this uh podcast. Oh, <laughs> um so okay, so now now we know that okay, there's there's really weird stuff that starts happening. Um <laughs> pretty good for a sci-fi movie um, i'm <laughs> thinking at this point um mm -hmm. so now the pond is completely dry so what happens then so when it's completely dry there's going to be first i have to mention that there is a particular plant that is able to tolerate the inundation more so than the other plants and then that one because it's kind of used to it over the years that particular plant is more prolific it's more spread throughout the entire area and that one is able to survive inundation while it's happening. So they can photosynthesize while underwater. And then when it dries out, they can get back to their regular pho photosynthesis and kind of outcompete and go faster than all the other species that died. So that is what normally happens. So as soon as the pond dries out, that particular species starts to get back up and take over the area. And then there are other species that come afterwards. But then there are also the terrestrial insects that come back to that area. So there are a lot of beetles, a lot of worms, a lot of flies, particularly, that come to the area. And ooh, one other thing, too, like just before um, fully drying out, when you have particular organisms, so sometimes the invasive cane toad, uh, Rhinella marina, shows up in my pond, which isn't necessarily the best thing for the ecosystem because it's toxic at every life stage. So most of the organisms in the pond do not eat it. If they eat it, they will die. But when the pond dries out pretty quickly, about a day losing water, they're able to die. And then their death attracts so many different flies that normally wouldn't be attracted in their terrestrial conditions. So I'm seeing different phases of organisms appear at different stages. So just as it's flooded during the entire inundation, when it's drying out, and then back to the terrestrial, um, terrestrial environment. And then the terrestrial environment returns to its normal ecosystem it's normal assemblage afterwards yeah that's why I, I wanted to ask you about those different stages you know because i'm really curious to see like what attracts what what, what happens mm -hmm. when um what happens to all the microscopic life when it dries out so i've actually been sampling the microscopic life in another part of the pond that doesn't get any water at all too and i've seen that they're still there there are different species and different numbers but when you inundate them with water again they're still there they're still active and they're still doing their thing. There are more predators than any bacteria or algae in that, in those other non wetted parts, but they're still active. They'll add some water to them and they come back to life and you can see them. Is it stuff like rotifers? You know, the, the stuff that can kind of go into uh, like a, a state of kind of, I don't want to call it sleep because that's not accurate, but they can kind of, you know, survive you know, and, and stop their metabolism? Is it, is it like that? Yeah, so there are quite a lot of rotifers, but there are also ciliates as well too, in addition to one other group, ciliates and nematodes. So nematodes I do find, not many of them, but I do find them in the soil as well too. Wow, 
That is so cool. I, I really, it's one of the things I want to do is when I move to the East Coast of Canada sometime later this year, I want to build a pond in my backyard. But I, now I'm actually videos. inspired. What's that? Send videos. <laughs> I will. I will. Absolutely. But now you've actually inspired me to do an experiment to build a temporary pond. Mm -hmm. Like it's so fascinating because when it comes to temporary ponds, a lot of previous research wouldn't really care much about them because it's just there for a little while, but there's so, there's so many organisms that are there, even if it is that little while, and it kind of connects different ecosystems. So nearby to my pond, there's a larger reservoir, and those organisms, whenever it rains, whenever their ponds build up, they'll leave their, reg their regular reservoir environment and come to my pond in order to get more food and have more places to raise their young. So it's like, even though it's not there all the time, when it is, it's still impactful. And if those young are able to survive, to be able to leave that pond um, as adults flying away, then they could increase population. And one of the things too that I focused on with my research was getting people to understand what benefits these uh, these creatures have to their environments. So what I did was focus on one particular species of a back swimmer called Lanotelectid, and I fed them mosquitoes and see and saw how many they would eat in a day. So I fed them throughout their development and I fed them in different uh, conditions. So if there are 100, how many they, could they take down? If there are 200, how many could they take down individually? And what I've found is the adults themselves can eat up to 120 larvae per day. So that's quite important, especially seeing that there are so many of them. They can increase the, the population of um, notenectids and decrease the populations of mosquitoes and hopefully with more protection, they be able to decrease the transmissible diseases that are spread by mosquitoes as well. So. Oh, that's a great, great, great thing for you to say. Because um, first of all, I just want to clarify the the creature you're talking about is called Notonecta. 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 So yeah, the species itself is Notonecta and well, Notonecta indica, and it's in the group of back swimmers called Notonectidae. Okay, so this creature eats a ton of mosquito larvae, and what you're saying is that this might have a practical application in places where the mosquitoes carry disease. Yes. So um, one of the things as well is that mosquitoes are, well, the most prevalent mosquitoes are the ones in human centers, so the ones that are close to cities and towns, and this organism itself lives within an urban area here. So instead of actually putting out the effort to do fogging or spray, you could just protect the temporary water bodies or even the general water bodies overall and have the natural ecosystem do its job in fighting the mosquito populations. Okay, then next question. Let's talk about this creature for a second here. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible to actually um, prepare like um, a container full of them that you could export to, let's say, Ottawa, <laughs> for example? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we can sprinkle those creatures in our ponds. Could you do that? It technically is possible, but um, every region has its own set of notenectids that could do that job. The actual numbers might vary based on the location of the species, like how many um, larvae they're able to eat per day. But the most important thing is that those environments are protected so they can do their job. I've also found, too, that the rearing in the lab isn't too um, successful. So there's better success if they're raised in their natural environment and then allowed to live and get their food and everything than if they're laying in the in the lab and grew up in the lab. The mortality I would see is higher. And I've seen that in yeah. a lot of paper as well. Too. Yeah, that's something I want to talk about in a minute here. But I just want to ask you a few more questions about this creature because I'm really fascinated. Mm -hmm. You're saying that it can be found. So I probably have some here in Ottawa. You definitely do. Okay. So because one of the things that they always tell us here in, in Canada is that if you have a pond or a, a thing that's that's got stagnant water, get rid of it. You're going to get a ton of mosquitoes. So get rid of the water. So, so that, is that bad or good advice? It's actually both, but depending on the context. So mosquitoes, as we all know, are very voracious. They are quite cunning as well too. So the main focus with discharging the, the water bodies for mosquitoes would be the smaller ones. So anything that is like a container, like a, a bottle container that would host water, the mosquitoes themselves could get food and breed in that water. But the larger organisms that would normally eat it, they need more space. So they're not able to actually 
get to the mosquitoes at those small levels. But if you have a pond that is much larger, that both the mosquitoes and the notelectives or their predators can get to, then yes, there would be mosquitoes still laying, but they'd be laying in specific places where their predators would be able to find them and control their numbers. Versus in cryptic spaces where even we couldn't find them quite directly and the predators themselves could not find them. Gotcha. Okay, so build a pond, empty out any container that is smaller than, I don't know, a couple feet, right? Yeah, that one would be pretty good pretty good advice. So like a bird but, bath, for example, that must be a good host for mosquitoes. Yeah, that would be a good a good host for mosquitoes. Um, there's definitely more work that needs to be done to find out exactly what insects are able to follow the mosquitoes. One of the interesting things about the mosquitoes, though, and with temporary ponds and mosquitoes, is mosquitoes are kind of smart. They are able to detect water that has predator um, predator caramones or predator molecules in them. So if they if they detect a body of water that is full of predators, they'll choose not to lay their eggs or not as many eggs in those waters and choose for ones that just got flooded or just got inundated with water. And their, can, their population can grow from that. But with the species that I'm working with, because it is migratory or dispersive, and it can readily move from its normal environment to different temporary ponds, when it gets particular rain cues, it can kind of follow those mosquitoes. So initially, rain fills up the pond and the mosquitoes come because there are no predators, thinking everything is safe. But those predators then follow them into those ponds and can control their populations overall. Oh my God. Okay, hold on here. So the mosquitoes, <laughs> this is so cool. I love that you know all these facts about creatures. Um, the mosquitoes can smell when there are predators, like they can smell it from in the air? They can smell it from the air and they can smell it even if the insect has been, the predator has been removed for several days. Whoa. Yeah. But this little, this little dude here, the not a necta is smarter, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it can actually it can actually then go find the mosquito where where the mosquito laid the eggs. Yes, so I'm not sure if it's specifically following the mosquitoes, but whenever it rains and it fills up ponds, those one those ponds are what attract them to that area. So it could be for breeding, but it could also be for feeding as well too. Because I found yes, they do feed in the ponds, but they also do lay eggs in the ponds as well. Okay, I need to go out looking for these uh, these little creatures. Um, how do I find them? Uh, they should be in, well, now it might be a bit tricky because it's winter. Um, but when it comes to calmer conditions or warmer conditions, you should be able to see them pretty easily in um, in the water. If you look at the, the surface of a large enough pond, and large enough is about, the smallest I've ever seen them in is about a square meter of water. So you can look anything larger than that. The depth can be important as well too, but the area is more is what attracts them more because they can kind of detect the kind of the light that reflects off of the water. All right, sorry about that. Uh, Gavin and I unfortunately got cut off unexpectedly. Uh, Gavin, you were just telling me that the uh, Nodonecta um, can live in a body of water about one meter wide. You said it does. The depth didn't matter, so I should just go looking for it in ponds, right? Yeah, look for it in ponds and you'll be able to find them pretty much everywhere. They might be in groups, but they might be single as well too. And you could even see different stages of development for it. And there are different species as well too. There's even one species that has hemoglobin that it uses to keep itself buoyant at a particular level in the water. Instead of, so normally they breathe air, so they have to go to the surface to breathe air sometimes. And then they go down to hunt and get food. But there's one particular um, genus that has hemoglobin that can keep themselves just at one particular one particular level in the water because they can store oxygen more readily. That is so cool. Are are they the same creatures that have like the little air bubble at the end of their butt? They do have air layers, yes. Um, they do have air layers, yeah. But I'm not sure if it's the bubble itself. It might form a thin film, but the bubble that I've seen so far for these insects have been particularly with the diticids, the diving beetles. And I can even, I have a bunch of pictures and videos because I'm always recording. So I can send you those as well too. 
Yeah, it's funny because I actually, so I love um, creating pond jars, right? So in mm-hmm. the spring, I'll go get like a sample of the dirt, some of the, the plants that are just, just starting to grow, and I'll put mm-hmm. it in a big jar and then I'll just watch it. And I actually have a pond jar from last spring with creatures that are still thriving in there. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things about them. They're so resilient when it comes to adapting to whatever situation they're in. So if it is if it is a small jar like yours, they'll find a way to survive. Yeah, it's really wonderful. Uh, speaking of survival, you mentioned we were talking earlier about uh, growing creatures in the lab. I mm. noticed on your Instagram that you um, kind of adopted or, I don't know, <laughs> grew a dragonfly? Yes. Um, so last year when I was doing my preliminary tests for what I'm doing for the PhD you now, I saw that there was this incredibly cute dragonfly and I just had to see what's going on with it. And I actually got two of them at the same time and I reared them and I fed them mosquitoes on a regular basis. Um, And unfortunately, the cutest one died, but um, the second one was able to actually emerge as an adult. And it was was such a magical moment because for the weekend, I had been feeding that particular one and I realized for the past few days before it emerged as an adult, it wasn't really eating as much. And I was like, no, eat, don't die, please. <laughs> but um, I get it. I left it with enough food for the weekend because I had a trip that day or that weekend. And when I came back, it wasn't in its container. I was like, if you're dead, you should be here. So I went and I looked around and I couldn't find it for about 10 minutes or so because it was outside in my room. One of its, um, its container in my room. So I was a bit concerned because I saw one day I thought it left and died as well too. But I heard some fluttering and I was just, yes, you're alive. And I went searching the entire room for it and I actually found it. And it seemed like it had just emerged because it wasn't really flying that well. But I got to stick my finger out and came and it came on my finger. And it was just such an emotional moment. Oh, it recognized its daddy. Yeah, it was just like, it was comfortable with me. It was, it was just so awesome to see that that small, tiny, tiny dragonfly that I raised became an adult and was able to be cool with me. And it was just so awesome. <laughs> that is so beautiful because I've, I've seen a, a few dragonfly larvae under the microscope and they, they look terrifying. <laughs> to be honest with you, they really do. They, they're they monstrous. Um, mm-hmm. But the fact that they turn into these beautiful winged creatures, I mean, that's phenomenal. Yeah, that, that is incredibly beautiful. And they do look terrifying and they can be to the aquatic organisms because they eat pretty much anything that can fit in their mouths, even tadpoles and fish, small enough. So they can be quite terrifying to the aquatic environment. But to us, they're all good. They're all safe. Uh, it seems to me that the dragonfly is is your favorite creature because everything associated <laughs> to you on on the internet um, is prefixed by the word dragon. <laughs> that is true. So my favorite insect is the dragonfly, and I just generally like words that have dragon before them. So dragon fruit, love it. Dragonfly, love <laughs> it. Dragon tree, love it. Like it's just so. There are always such interesting features about those dragon items that are interesting. So the dragon are you, is, mm-hmm. are you into the mythical dragons as well? Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay, so the, like the dragon as a whole is like the symbol of you. Yeah, I really love them. They're so cool. Like even when I was younger, I had this obsession with the Komodo dragon because it just had the word dragon in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so this has been going on for a while then. Yeah, it has. Like originally, I thought my my calling species were bees. And they are cool, like, they are super cool. I love seeing different kinds of bees, um, not the, the common bee right now. The other ones that have, like, such small features and they're so tiny and cute. I love those ones, but dragonflies are my number one. So tell me a couple of quick, uh, cool facts about dragonflies. Uh, so dragonflies can take several weeks, up to several years, in their aquatic stage as nymphs. So depending on the conditions, the environmental conditions, they could spend... I think the most I've ever seen was seven years as nymphs in the pond before they become adults. Another cool, interesting fact is that their flight patterns are different from most insects. So they, because of their different wing structure, they're able to fly more precisely. So they can fly forward, backwards, up, down, 
and they can very easily target on prey because of their incredibly well-developed eyes. Can they fly upside down? Upside down? I believe I've so. Never but I've, I've never seen one. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen one flying upside down either. If I did mention that before, that might have been an error because there's no, I don't have any confirmation for that. Okay, yeah, I was just curious because I've never seen one, but maybe they can and I'm just not lucky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Um cool. It is It is pretty cool. I mean, I think the work that you're doing has, uh, I mean, already it's it's definitely, it must be something that really satisfies your curiosity. It actually does. I'm kind of too much. <laughs> um, so currently since, what is it, April 2020 up to now, I've been reading so many different articles on different aspects of the pond. So much so that I have around 687 references right now. And that's just for the past few months. And normally, references for a PhD would be about 300, 400. And I had some other ones before that, some other references before that. So there's so many different facets to it and so many things to learn about it that I kind of get almost every night, I get carried away in something about the, the pond or a particular species that I found in the pond. So it's, it's I have to kind of rein, my, rein myself in a little bit because if I do not, I will spend hours up a week doing work and trying to find new interesting things, find out what's going on with my particular pond, doing um, more research and more analysis, and not get enough sleep. And that that's not that's not good. <laughs> you know, I can very much relate to that kind of. That, that's I think a, a personality trait. It's like an obsession. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like yeah. an artist working on a a sculpture for nine months it's like giving birth to something you know you're like you're like always working on it and and something yeah. new comes along and then you're curious you're you're curious about the next thing um mm-hmm. but you're right is that this obsession can be detrimental mm-hmm. like one of the things that i noticed with me personally is that if i don't get enough sleep regularly my eyes start itching me and i start sneezing like crazy so to avoid those detrimental effects, I kind of have to cut back sometimes and put myself to sleep. And I also don't want to get too hyper-focused on any work and then neglect actual life. So I try to make sure that every day I watch my cartoons and things and do things that aren't work-related to make sure I have more of a balance. Because as much as it is cool, it is important. So is my time on Earth and me enjoying my life separate from work. You know, you said watch your cartoons, and I immediately had a huge smile on my face. So now oh. I need to know, <laughs> what are the cartoons you're watching? So currently I'm watching the Troll Hunter series, and I'm on season one right now. Just about finishing up season one, going on to season two. But there's so many different series that I've watched. The most recent one before Troll Hunters was Carmen San Diego. I started watching Archer last year as well, too. I'm a, a big Avatar fan and Avatar, um, Avatar Aang and Avatar Korra fan. That whole world, ever since I was a kid, has been so fascinating to me that it's kind of become a part of my personality now. So when I'm walking on the street, listening to music, going to a lab or anywhere, I would be bending, if you know what bending is. I, you know, I know of bending because of style bender in the, in the UFC. <laughs> Ah, okay. <laughs> you know, or like the or like the air benders. Uh, I think there was like a live action movie, but I have yeah. not watched the animated shows, which I hear are absolutely marvelous. They are like some of the best in a long while, and they keep remaking them because they're so good. But um, it's it's something that's become a part of me because when I was younger, I used to have, well, I still have some anxiety issues. But being able to relate to the show so well. And being able to express myself through bending was like a way of connecting to a separate world that wasn't this one that made me so anxious. So it's kind of personally something that is a part of me now that I fully embrace. It's really, it's so cool that you you found solace in something like animated series, you know? Yeah, and that's, that's a part of the reason why I wanted to go or why I will go into voice acting because... Not only have I been influenced by um, by animation in the way I speak, so I do get animated with some of my <laughs> some of my expressions, but also I love the emotion that gets carried across in these particular moments and in these particular episodes, series, TV shows, everything. It's like it doesn't have to be this current world, it doesn't have to be what's going on right now, but it still hits those human human aspects. 
if they'll hit the idea of wanting to belong, wanting to feel important, wanting to be great at something and getting to understand who you are, all those different aspects. I love that. And that's that's what's interesting is that, you know, I when I interview scientists, you know, people have this perception that scientists are like the nerds with the lab coats, you know, Mm -hmm. and what I think we don't realize is that these are normal people who have other interests and who have passions and who have anxiety, like you just said, you know, Mm -hmm. a little, you know, there's all sorts of different kinds of scientists. And, and to me, this, this is um, really interesting that you're going into voice acting. And of course, now I have to ask you, do you think you (laughs) want to become a voice actor for a living? Or is this something you just want to do on the side? I'd want to do both, actually. I'd want to be in voice acting and also doing my research because they're both something I enjoy. And something my mom told me from when I was a very young boy was that I can do anything. I can be in any career that I want to. I don't have to sacrifice one for the other. And there's no limit on how much I can learn. So even if I want to become a race car driver at 40, I can. There's no limit. There's no restriction to my interests, my happiness, my possibilities my potential in life so as much as research i'm thinking right now would be the main focus until i get my career of course in (laughs) in voice acting and i still want to do both i know that i'll still be curious in science and i'll still be watching cartoons every day so i'd want to be doing both and even if there is something else that comes along i am ready to jump into that as well too well first of all your mother actually encouraged you. This is uh, mind-blowing because this isn't a very common thing. Usually your parents want you to be something. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes it's they want you to be something that you're not. Um, mm. But it's so beautiful. Uh, what's your mother's name? My mom's name is Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie? Yes. Oh, well, Anne-Marie, you've done a fantastic job, first of all. <laughs> and secondly, <laughs> uh, what do you think she would say about you today? She constantly tells me how proud she is of me. And it is something that's so amazing to hear because we didn't grow up with the most of everything. And it was a struggle a lot of, a lot of the times because she was a single parent raising two, two children. So it was, at the beginning, things were rough. They got rough, but we never lost that, that connection we had. One of the things that I really appreciate about her to this day too, yes, she's always supported me. She never said, I have to do this, I have to do that. She was all like, whatever you want to do, I'll support you. Go for it. You have sense. Good job. And the second thing was she would always be there for me. There would be times when I'd be upset and upset with her. And before I left home, she would make me hug her and tell me that she loves me before I left out. Because she's very she's very emotionally invested, as moms are, <laughs> in me. And I, I really loved that. At the time, I was just like, I don't want to hug you. But now I'm like... I always felt loved. I always was appreciated and cared for, no matter what the situation. We could have had just we could have just had a fight. My mom loves me regardless. And that that is something that I carry forth in my complete being right now. And I I can't thank her enough for that. That's uh very touching and, and very honest and very beautiful. Um I appreciate that you shared that here. Um, and you are also uh, some one, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on my show is because you have this beautiful attitude uh, on Twitter. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it's a very anxious time for a lot of people. Um, mm-hmm. It's very hard sometimes to find people who are happy and who are uh, encouraging. And you always seem to, I feel like every tweet that comes out of you has a smile attached to it. <laughs> that That would probably be accurate. <laughs> Um, One of the things, so I am quite in tune with what's going on with me. If I have any issues, any problems, I don't try to project onto them. I acknowledge them as, oh, I'm feeling left out. Why do I feel left out? I try to analyze what's going on instead of projecting any insecurities that I have. And with that comes being vulnerable with myself. Like sometimes I do not do enough work. Sometimes I am lazy. Sometimes I, um, sometimes I'm messy. But I accept those things and not try to hide them. And if I want to work on them, I do. So the messy one, that one's fine with me. But when it comes to certain aspects, um, some other aspects, like one of the things with me too was like I saw um, a fellow researcher of mine that's in my group that was doing some work with work that I had helped her with. And she was doing more than I had helped her with. And I was like, oh gosh, she's better at me than this. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so blah, blah. 
But what I did was in that moment, at that very moment, I was all like, even if she does better than you, that does not mean you're not, you're not doing your own work. You have time. She has time to do that work. I have my own work that I'm doing. Just because someone is better at me than someone does not negate my value, my quality. And I shouldn't be comparing what I'm doing to what someone else is doing because we're two different people. We have different priorities. We have different resources. And it's completely fine if someone's better than better at something than you. It doesn't mean that you're any less than. It doesn't mean that you're being lazy. It doesn't mean that you're going to be um, living on the street in the next few days. So it's, it's, about, it's about addressing a... those insecurities and going forward with them. Yeah, that's a that's a beautiful attitude to have. And I think that that kind of attitude will carry you forward for a very long time. It'll it'll help you achieve the things that you want to achieve. And it'll make you uh, very pleasant to be around as well. I think, um, you know, you we inspire people by being inspiring, by being ourselves, by being vulnerable, by being open. So I think that's very, very beautiful. Um, Gavin, we have a couple of minutes left. I want to know what's next for you. So I know you're you're doing the voice acting um, yes. on the side. You're also doing your PhD. So when is the PhD going to be done? So I'm currently working on my samples and my analyses, and I plan to finish on April 20, well, on or before April 21st, 2021. So I'm working specifically towards that date and all my progress updates have been towards that. Um, but afterwards, I want to take at least a month off not doing things because I've been going to school for years straight. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice to not have to do work and not have any responsibilities for a while. So I'd like to take a month off. And then I'm currently looking for jobs to actually go into the scientific field. And I'm a bit anxious about it because... I know it won't be the same as this. It will be a whole different world. But I'm also excited because the world is literally endless in possibilities. And I could be anywhere doing anything in the next few months. And that's just amazing. Like, I'm so excited to be a part of anything, anywhere. And I'm happy about that. I bet. Any <laughs> chances that you'll be looking for work in uh, North America or Europe? Or do you want to really stay in Jamaica? Um, well, there are not many options in Jamaica, unfortunately, for sciences. So what I want to do is travel a bit. So I've been to Europe a little bit, and seeing that the COVID situation is a bit hectic there, I want to focus on other countries. And I particularly want to experience countries in the East and their cultures, because that's so very different from mine. And I want to learn more about them. I want to learn more about what's different. Seeing that the, the working environment in, in France was so different, how can other environments in other countries be different and add to my life, to the quality of my life? North America, though, um, Canada, yes. The U.S., not so much right now. Mm -hmm. where, where would you go in Canada if you had a choice? Um, I like Vancouver, but I see that it's quite expensive. And I'd like to stay not in Toronto because I have too many, uh, there are too many Jamaicans there and I don't want to be stuck in a... <laughs> I don't want to be stuck in a situation where I'm only around my people. I want to experience other cultures as well, too. So You should go to Montreal at some point. Mm, nice. I never thought of it, but definitely in for it. Even Quebec as well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, listen, Gavin, it has been an absolute pleasure getting to know you, uh, getting to know a lot more about the, the research that you're doing, which I think is absolutely fascinating. I hope that you're going to tweet me when uh, when you're done that and when you get some more results, because I'm really curious about that. And absolutely. I wish you all the best with the um, the voice acting. I think it's a, it's a fun uh, profession, a fun field to go into. So I wish you all the best with that as well. Thank you so much, Julie. And I wish you all the best with everything that you're doing. And if you ever want to talk, ever want any advice, any updates on anything. I am always here and always willing and happy to talk. You're the best. Thanks, Gavin.